think that's all I've got. Um, I thought we'd talk about the tonsils today. I thought we'd already done it, but apparently not. Um, I don't know if you've been watching my vlogs, but a little while ago I did one about, because um, I was ill, I did a couple of anatomy videos, or one, where I had a sore throat. And the vlog from that week, I was running and talking about whether you keep running, training, you know, for races and stuff, when you have an upper respiratory tract infection. Anyway, the point I made was that when our family tends to get this type of illness, Kim tends to take longer to recover than the rest of us. And she had her tonsils removed when she was a kid. So when people talk about tonsils, they talk of what they mean are the palatine tonsils. So we'll look at the different types of tonsils and what tonsils do in this video. Um, so I, I always said that, well, it's only anecdotal, but it seems that Kim takes longer to recover from an upper respiratory tract infection than we do, and maybe that's because she hasn't got any palatine tonsils. Turns out there's a recent big data study looking at uh, the Danish population um, by a joint Australian-Danish group, and they found that kids that had had their tonsils removed um, had an increased risk of developing respiratory tract diseases later in life. So maybe it's not anecdotal, maybe there is something to it. There are good reasons for removing tonsils at certain times, um, airway things, snoring things. See, removing the palatine tonsils cures recurrent tonsillitis, infection and inflammation of the tonsils, which itself is a very unpleasant thing. So there are good reasons to remove tonsils sometimes, but it looks like we have to be a little bit more um, cautious of when we do it. I didn't realise that that many tonsils were still being removed from kids, but apparently, apparently they are. Anyway, that's the topic for today, the tonsils. We've got big head today and ooh, we've got half head and we can see, I think, all of the tonsils on there. There are four sets of tonsils. So the questions we're going to answer are, what are the tonsils and where are the tonsils? Um, okay, so what are the tonsils? We've got they're masses of lymphoid tissue dotted around the airway here. So look, there's the nose, there's the mouth, there's the nasal cavity, oral cavity. So air is coming in here and going down to the larynx. So they're around this, this airway entry into the body. And the tonsils are essentially collections of lymphoid follicles, lymphatic follicles, follicles, lymphatic follicle, follicles, lymphoid tissue supported by connective tissue. So it being lymphoid tissue, it means that what we're finding in here, this is, um, this is part of the immune system. It's, uh, it's gonna have a load of B cells and T cells in there. So B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. It's also got, on the surface, it's got some um, antigen presenting cells, antigen detecting cells, antigen collecting cells. It's got cells that recognise antigens, um, so it can be the first site of response to a pathogen entering this part of the body through the airway and can then trigger and mount an immune response by encouraging the B cells and the T cells to respond. So the B cells, the B lymphocytes are the cells that make antibodies, mostly IgA I think. Um, so they can, we can start to mount a local immune response to the pathogens that have entered the body before it gets too big a deal. Of course. You can imagine you're probably getting a fair few pathogens in um, to your airways and yeah. They are covered by the same mucosa that is in the area that the tonsil is in. So for example, up in the respiratory epithelium, the ciliated pseudostratified columna epithelium up here, the, uh, the tonsils up here are covered by the same epithelium, the same mucosa. So because they're covered in this mucosa, they're part of the malt, the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissues. It's like a secret club, isn't it? It's like a <laughs> um, payers patches in the GI tract are also part of the malt, the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue club, right? Um, they, have, they all have crypts, so they have essentially folds from the surface of the tonsil down into the depths of the tonsil. Um, all of them except for the, the adenoids up here have that. Um, they have pretty good blood supply, so when, you when they're responding to an infection, so when you have an upper respiratory tract infection that's got going, these tend to swell and enlarge as, as they become 
like there's an increased blood supply to the tonsil and also they tend to get inflamed and what have you. It's those crypts that tend to, you know, if you've got like really crypty tonsils, um, they're the ones that tend to collect bacteria and suffer from like recurrent inflammation, recurrent tonsillitis, which causes a problem. And as I said, there are four sets. So where are they? This group of lymphoid tissue, these tonsils surrounding the airway get referred to as Waldeyer's tonsillar ring. So that's the principle is that they're surrounding the, the airway. Um, and they're in the, the pharynx, the various parts of the pharynx back here. So we've got the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx, which are posterior to the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, and the larynx, right? So these guys here, it's in the, it's in the wall here, um, these are the palatine tonsils. These are the tonsils that people refer, talk about when they say your tonsils. When somebody says, oh, I've had my tonsils out, it's these tonsils they tend to be referring to, the palatine tonsils. Now this relates to, when was it, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about um, the, the swallowing, didn't we? And we looked at um, palatopharyngeus the muscle, so there are, the, the, well, there are three longitudinal pharyngeal muscles that lift the pharynx up when you're swallowing, uh, and this is the soft palate here. Palatopharyngeus is a muscle that runs from the palate, the soft palate, um, down to the pharynx, um, and it's kind of, so it forms an, arc, <laughs> forms an arch, right? If you've got two palatopharyngeus muscles doing that, we have um, an arch. And then you have uh, another muscle, palatoglossus, going from the palate to the tongue, glossus. So you actually have, you have two arches, right? So you've got... Um, <laughs> Anyway, so between, if that's palato, if you've got palatopharyngeus and palatoglossus, your palatine tonsils are in between the two in what we call the, the isthmus of forces. Forces, isthmus, isthmus of forces. Um, right. So if you look inside, there's a tongue. You can do this in a mirror as well, ah, you'll see this. All right, so either side of the tongue, the first pillars are formed by the palatoglossus muscles, and the second set of pillars are formed by palatopharyngeus. And if I split you in half, all right, so that's, that's palatoglossus there, going from the palate to the tongue, uh, and we've got the muscles running from the palate to the pharynx. All right, so that there, that is, the palatine tonsil, there's, there's a palatine tonsil on either side. So we can also see that then here. So those are the palatine tonsils. Um, their sensory innervation is uh, the trigeminal nerve and the second branch of the trigeminal nerve, so the, um, and the glossopharyngeal nerve, glossopharyngeal, glosso tongue, pharynx, this is that sort of. It's in charge of that sort of region, really, the glossopharyngeal nerve. The blood supply to this tonsil and to most of these tonsils are essentially any nearby arteries. There are lots of arteries around here. We looked at the superficial and deep arteries of the face and how they all link up. All of those arteries are going to be supplying blood to these guys here. They've got quite a rich blood supply. And that's one of the big problems with, with taking the tonsils out is there's a lot of bleeding. And they've got a fairly good fibrous capsule covering them, but it's those guys that tend to cause the problems in recurrent tonsillitis, right? Infection and inflammation of these guys. Now, right next to them here, uh, this is the lingual tonsil. So there's the tongue. This is the base of the tongue. So the posterior base of the tongue, that's where you find a lingual tonsil, really, really nearby. Um, and that also sends sensory innovation back through the glossopharyngeal nerve which is also innervating that posterior part of the tongue anyway okay so um, palatine tonsils lingual tonsils then we go up here to the nasopharynx and we have the tubal tonsils and the, the pharyngeal tonsils maybe a bit of a daft name since they're all in the pharynx but we'll get there now the tubal tonsils we've looked here before do you remember what this opening is here this is the, the opening of the pharyngotympanic tube or the auditory tube or the eustachian tube. Um, so that's connecting to the, the middle ear space. Remember there's the external acoustic meters, you got the middle ear, 
and then the pressure in the middle ear is equalized by this opening here in the in the nasopharynx now the bulge around here this is where you find the tubal tonsils there's also a collection of lymphoid tissue of tonsillar tissue around here incidentally this kind of raised horseshoe shape you might even call it a torus shape right because it's an incomplete ring um, it gets called the torus tubarius torus tubarius anyway that's where you find that mass of tubal tonsillar tissue around there um, now here this midline so this is a mid sagittal section of the head so this is a, a midline, you might call it a single tonsil. This is the pharyngeal tonsil. And this is what people are referring to when they're talking about your adenoids. It's attached to, the, we're, we're at the, this is the sphenoid, sphenoid sinus here. This is the sphenoid bone here. So they're up against the sphenoid bone. Um, and these tend to get called the adenoids. They tend to get talked about when they enlarge. Because when they enlarge, they can affect the airway. They can affect the vocal sounds that are being made they, in kids. They can affect the development of the, of, the, of the bones and the shape of the face and the nasal cavity and that sort of thing. It's probably these guys that get implicated in snoring when they enlarge more than the other ones and that sort of thing. So these are the adenoids, so they often get removed for those reasons, when they get enlarged and they start causing issues. And not always in childhood, sometimes in, in adulthood, right? Sleep apnea, snoring, that sort of thing. Um, adenoids there, and um, that's, that's about it really. Pharyngeal tonsils, tubal tonsils, lingual tonsil, palatine tonsils, and sometimes you get a bit of tonsillar lymphoid tissue in the soft palate as well. But that's it, that's Waldeyer's tonsillar ring. So this is another one of those situations where we've added on to the anatomy of the, of the pharynx, of the head and the neck, and really, blood supply and nervous innovation, you can, you can work out from your existing knowledge. You know the cranial nerves that are there, you know all the arteries and the deep face and, and what have you, all of those guys get involved. So rather than sitting there and learning complicated detail, boring tables, possibly in more detail than you actually need, do this holistic thing, look at all the anatomy and then work it out in your head. And I know it's easier said than done, isn't it? But there you go, it's one of these things that grows. It's one of those things that grows, science and anatomy are good like that. Right, from me and from Big Head, goodbye. Um, we'll, see you, we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>